SCP-5007 Bass Strait The Bass Strait is a section of water that separates the states of Victoria and Tasmania in southeastern Australia. It is sometimes referred to as the Bass Strait Triangle, inspired by the Bermuda Triangle, due to the numerous disappearances and shipwrecks that have occurred in the area, alongside a number of UFO sightings. While it's easy to dismiss the UFO sightings as nonsense and the shipwrecks due to being a hazardous area, some people will continue to turn to the supernatural for explanations. SCP-5007 is one such supernatural explanation, one focused around some very odd UFOs and something very big lurking in the depths. SCP-5007 is a collective designation of malicious, partially humanoid entities that maintain a territory across the Bass Strait. Generally, 5007 are composed of between two and nine human bodies fused together amidst large clusters of black tentacles. The length of the tentacles seems to vary between 2 and 70 meters and appear fused to the body's skin. The stomachs of 5007 instances are grossly distorted and swollen, with sizes approaching 15 to 20 meters in diameter. 5007 instances are capable of passive flight by producing enormous quantities of gases within their stomachs, and across the surfaces of these organs most instances develop clusters of simple eyes and bioluminescent organs. Many of their humanoid components appear to have been removed and reattached at seemingly random points. Human segments of 5007 appear to remain independent of one another, and their behavior suggests a great deal of discomfort. They do vocalize, but they are largely incoherent, typically comprised of gasps, moans, and whimpers. There have been reports of the entities imploring other individuals to approach them when encountered, however. There's also been instances where the entities are observed making ineffectual attempts at self-harm or destruction of their stomach organs. 5007 instances have been known about since at least 1858, with the first successful visual recordings accomplished in 1982, when an entity was recorded abducting five children from a Tasmanian beach. Each recorded encounter with 5007 entities has followed a similar pattern. The victims are almost always alone or otherwise unsupervised, and curiously, the victims are always individuals that don't require visual aids, such as glasses. 5007 may appear in any weather condition, time of day, or time of year, and they appear to be able to navigate all weather with minimal difficulty. All encounters have occurred within the Bass Strait, with a major preference for smaller coastal towns or small boats. The 5007 entity will move towards the shore, stalking the intended victim for a short time before lowering numerous tentacles and appendages to physically grab the individual. The entity may occasionally abduct multiple people at once, with one instance successfully abducting eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat within 15 seconds of one another. Once the victims are grabbed, the entity will return to the open water at a great speed, often in excess of 320 kilometers per hour, or nearly 200 miles per hour. Tracking them has shown that they inhabit a remote reef within the strait, resting and depositing abductees there. Initial investigations into the abductions led to a wide array of theories, including an anomalous group of persons, one or more hostile aerial entities inhabiting the stratosphere, phenomena associated with UFOs, subterranean anomalies, time quirks, and unusual weather patterns. Investigations accelerated in 1980, after Agent Taberner's three young children and wife disappeared from a beach in broad daylight. The Foundation began their renewed investigations with a focus on simply locating the four lost Taberner family members, but the search rapidly opened up into a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances, following similar patterns along the Victorian coast and later the Tasmanian coast and local islands. 
The initial assumption was that they had been taken by members of a group of interest, but this was soon found to be incorrect. Within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were common across the entirety of the Bass Strait's coastal regions. The Foundation found that in a vast majority of cases, there were no witnesses to the abductions, but they were both preceded and followed by reports of lights in the sky, and more concrete sightings of unidentified flying objects described as looking like balloons. On May 23, 1982, emergency services call centers received a large number of UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. Task force operatives were dispatched to investigate, allowing them to confirm the appearance and existence of what are now documented as SCP-5007. The entity was successfully captured and transported to Site-40 for containment. We're next given an interview log between a Foundation doctor posing as a reporter and a witness to the disappearance of a former Australian Prime Minister. The witness, Alan Stewart, describes the day of the disappearance, with three other members of the group deciding not to go into the water, with Stewart describing the water as rough at the time. He and the Prime Minister, Harold Holt, were experienced swimmers, however, so they both went in. Once they were about waist deep, he could feel an undertow and asked Holt if they should stick to the shallows. Holt merely grinned and swam out further, eventually seeming less sure of himself as he continued. Stuart called out to him and told him that maybe he should come back in, to which Holt nodded. Then Holt looked over his shoulder and said something about some balloons. He asked Stuart if he could see the balloons around the cliff, to which Stuart said no, so Holt said that he was going to look. He said that they weren't normal balloons, that there was someone inside of them, and then he swam away. Stewart then says that the rip swept Holt away, like a leaf being pulled out in the tide. He could see him swimming sideways, trying to get out like you're supposed to. The doctor prods a little further, and Stewart says that sometimes in those kinds of situations, you think you see things. He doesn't want to tell the doctor, as he thinks he'll sound crazy, but the doctor assures him he won't. Stewart says that he thought he saw Holt start screaming and swimming the other way, as if he saw something awful out there in the water. And then Stewart says that he saw him getting pulled up into the air, as if something in the clouds reached it down and took him. Others brushed it off as a trick of the light, but he really doesn't think that it was. The closing statement of the interview says that since there's been 18 years since the incident, amnestics are not an option, and Mr. Stewart will have to be discredited if he attempts to spread his account of events. Following extensive interviews with witnesses, compiling a database of likely victims, and the containment of the first entity, it was determined that there must be at least 16 other entities yet unaccounted for. As a result, the search for their origin point was made a top priority. On May 19, 1985, Foundation survey teams operating out of Site-40 reported a sighting of a large SCP-5007 specimen headed towards the coastal town of Kilkunda, Victoria, from Bass Strait. A survey team was sent to track the entity in order to determine its point of origin, and were given a transcript of a video log taken from Sergeant Price's body camera. The four-man team is sitting in their own ship, behind protective covers, looking out at a large entity floating above a private fishing vessel. The instance is estimated to be 23 meters in diameter, and composed of seven different individuals. Five of them remain unidentified, but two of them have been confirmed as matching two individuals that disappeared on their honeymoon in 1963. One member of the team remarks that the people in the entity look like they're made of clay and have been crushed together, with a tentacle growing out of one woman's mouth. Sergeant Price reprimands them, saying that they're not people, they're just part of the specimen. Since it's clear that the entity is going to attack the boat, the team moves in to further observe. 
The boat is occupied by six individuals, five of whom are inside of the cabin eating breakfast, while the sixth is on the deck smoking. She's the first to spot the entity, and remarks out loud. The entity approaches the boat, several of its tentacles trailing in the water, and it slowly turns so that the majority of its humanoid parts are facing the woman on the deck. The entity then says, I see you. You will help me see. The woman curses and begins to run towards the cabin as the others notice the entity. She's quickly grabbed by a tentacle and pulled into the air as the woman's husband tries to run out of the cabin to rescue her, held back by the others. The entity proceeds to run its tentacles along the windows of the cabin until locating the door, and then a tentacle ending in a mass of human hands opens the door and enters the cabin, grabbing another individual and violently pulling them outside into the air. The other four panic and attempt to force the tentacle out of the cabin with objects at hand. One of the survey team asks the sergeant if they're sure they can't help them, but Price says that disrupting the event could jeopardize the mission. In the end, the entity successfully captures all six individuals and proceeds towards the survey team's boat. Price assures the team that the entry to their cabin is locked and rated to remain sealed under five tons of force, so they're fine. One member remarks that the humanoid parts of the entity are trying to strangle themselves and are throwing up an orange substance. The entity repeatedly tries to force its way into the entrance hatch, but is unable to gain entry. It lowers itself down and closely examines the ship and the crew, with one member remarking that its eyes are like beach balls. The entity eventually shudders before rising back into the air and departing, prompting the team to race after it. One member fires a tracking harpoon at it, which successfully embeds into one of its tentacles. They follow the entity for over four hours, with it finally slowing down upon approaching a large gray reef. Several shipwrecks are seen resting upon the reef, and thirteen other entities are floating over the area, some appearing to hold onto the reef with their tentacles. The entity holding the abductees lowers down and drops them onto the reef, at which point the six individuals notice the survey team's boat and begin running towards it. They are interrupted, however, by a large instance of SCP-4159, a carnivorous organism resembling kelp. Multiple other specimens emerge from the water, and they swarm one of the abductees, as the others wave to the team's ship for help. Price insists that they still remain here, as they need to observe what exactly the entities are doing. The remaining five abductees eventually give up and begin exploring the rest of the reef, where they discover a large pool in the center. They voice apprehensions about approaching it, fearing further attacks from 4159, but as they begin to move away from it, a number of both 5007 and 4159 entities converge upon them. Four of the individuals dive into the pool, while one hesitates before being swarmed by multiple 4159 specimens. The remaining individuals tread water in the pool while displaying severe distress until they begin to be pulled under the water one by one. When the area falls silent and it's clear that they're not coming back up, Price declares that they should go home. Afterwards, the reef has been declared as 5007-A, the home and origin of the entities and a provisional site was established nearby for monitoring and research. The reef measures approximately 1.3 square kilometers in size, and is largely composed of a previously unknown variety of dark porous rock, visually similar to granite, which often seeps iron oxide from an unknown source. This rock possesses the anomalous property of an extraordinarily fast rate of growth, achieving significant levels of growth in as little as 40 minutes. The violent waters in the area surrounding the reef prevent the growth rate from expanding the reef itself, 
but that doesn't impede the growth of rock over foreign objects resting upon it. As a result of this, there are numerous wrecked ships and aircraft on the reef that have been completely grown over with rock. It's also proven to be a haven for various anomalous forms of marine life, with much of its surface host to a form of red algae that are specialized to feed upon the freshly grown rock, along with numerous marine worms capable of temporary levitation, and marine spiders with leg spans of 1 to 3 meters that live below the waterline in silk retreats. Additionally, there are various small fish inhabiting the rock pools and surrounding waters that have not been discovered elsewhere, and SCP-4159 instances migrate here between November and March. It has been confirmed as the origin point for the 5007 entities, which often rest here holding on to outcroppings with their tentacles while inactive. The large pool in the center measures 33 meters in diameter, and extends to an as yet unknown depth below the surface, with unmanned exploration via drones showing it to have a depth of at least 4,000 meters. Water samples collected from this pit show large quantities of human DNA, a bacterium that was previously only found in permafrost from tens of thousands of years ago, and an unknown biological compound possessing significant life-preservative qualities. Testing has shown that organisms submerged in this solution are able to survive grievous injuries for an indeterminate amount of time, even when fully submerged and unable to breathe. Exploration of one of the shipwrecks located on the reef revealed a journal within a chest, with most of the text illegible due to water damage, but one passage proving to be of interest. It reads, February 1858, still headed east. The boys and me are still cursing Moresby for going after those Yankees causing us to have to sail the strait. Everyone knows the stories, and sure enough the sea is in a foul temper. The waves are many yards high in all directions, and we're forced to sail south so as to not be capsized. Me and Fletcher both seen things beneath the waves, like great black serpents with yellow eyes. I weren't going to tell the crew, lest I frighten them, but Fletcher went and spouted out about it. Feels as if they're whipping up these waves, and there's naught we can do of it. Moresby spied land ahead, and the boys say they're a giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there's naught we can do but beach ourselves and hope for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary and might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship had many human skeletons overgrown with rock lying inside, but it's believed that a ship of this size would have had many more crew, and the location of the remaining crew is as yet unknown. In 1978, a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait named Frederick Valentich went missing, with his disappearance attributed to SCP-5007. Transcripts of his transmissions to Melbourne Air Traffic Control during the event were released to the public prior to Foundation involvement, so they've had to make efforts to discredit paranormal theories surrounding his disappearance. They've taken to posing as members of the online UFO community to do so, while the official explanation for his disappearance is that Valentish became disoriented and saw his own lights reflected in the water or lights from a nearby island, while flying upside down. While that's certainly a perfectly cromulent explanation, we're provided the transcript during his disappearance to hear what actually happened. Valantich called into air traffic control, asking if there's any known air traffic below 5,000 feet. Control said that there wasn't, but Valantich insisted, claiming that there was a large, unknown aircraft in sight with what seemed like four bright landing lights. He then says that the aircraft passed over him at least a thousand feet above, 
and was now stationary. Valentich began idling his engine, and the aircraft continued to hover right above him. He tells Control that he intends to go to King Island, and says that the thing is hovering on top of him, and it's not an aircraft. The transmission is then interrupted by an unidentified noise described as being metallic, scraping sounds, before all contact was lost. The Foundation believes that those sounds were from the entity attacking Valentich's plane and attempting to jam the propellers with its biomass. Prior to the Foundation's involvement, there have been numerous searches for Valentich's wreckage, both government and civilian, all of which were unsuccessful. It was eventually found during a drone exploration of the central pit on the reef, embedded in the rocky walls 1200 meters below sea level. It appeared to have been crushed under tremendous pressure, but the Foundation was able to recover it for analysis. Analysis showed that the craft had suffered catastrophic engine failure due to a collision with a large biological mass, forcing the aircraft to be ditched into the water, causing further damage. They found human remains inside matching Valentich's description, mixed with DNA samples not matching any known form of life, along with an aftermarket cockpit recording device. The transcript of the recording shows Valentich begging the entity not to come closer, before the sound of a loud crash is heard and the engine stalling. Valentich shouts out that it crashed into him and jammed the propellers and he's going down. The entity is heard saying, you will see, and Valentich can be heard screaming and panicking for a short while. He then regains his composure and says that he's attempting to glide as long as he can before ditching in the water, hoping that someone will come looking. Nearly three minutes later, the plane impacts the water, and Valentich cries out in pain, saying that there's no leaks so far, and the thing fell off on impact. He's activated a distress call, but the radio is all smashed. Valentich begins to say something about apologizing to his dad, but the recording is damaged. It resumes as a loud splash and a banging sound is heard, and Valentich shouts that the tentacle is back and it's looking at him while grabbing the plane. The sound from outside becomes muffled, suggesting that the plane has been fully submerged, and Valentich panics again. 39 minutes go by before the plane can be heard groaning as though being crushed, followed by a shattering sound and rushing water. It's hypothesized that the entity pulled the plane at least 8,000 meters below sea level, and it's believed to be the same entity that the survey team tracked, as well as the same one that Alan Stewart saw. Following the construction of the provisional site off the shore of the reef, the Foundation began tracking all departures and returns of the entities, with entities returning with abducted victims 83% less often than prior to current containment procedures. However, in 2003, the site logged three instances departing the reef, and in 2008 recorded 36 instances returning, with only two not having any fresh abductees. No monitoring post has any records of missing persons, 5007 sightings, or satellite data indicating the presence of these as yet unaccounted for instances. This was followed by an event involving the largest 5007 entity, and a large tentacle originating from the pit on the reef. The specifics of this are expunged, but it took 78 hours and necessitated a 26% increase in on-site psychological counseling, so let your imagination run wild on that one. This was the first concrete evidence of a large entity located beneath the pit, something they've suspected for some time. This entity has been designated 5007-C, and of course this means that a manned exploration is necessary since drones weren't cutting it, I guess. 
The mission would involve the use of a Foundation-developed Deep Sea Submersible, capable of diving to a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater, named the SCPS Nautilus. This was developed after 37 failed expeditions into the pit, all of which failed due to hull collapse from the intense pressure. Since these failed explorations all resulted in the loss of various trained personnel, it was decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to run the Nautilus for the mission. Just for some fun reference numbers, the deepest known part of the ocean is the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench, with a depth of around 11,000 meters. Mount Everest, by comparison, has an elevation of only around 9,000 meters. Due to the pressures involved down there, the Foundation was unable to remotely view the camera footage, only able to see it once the vessel returned, and this has led to some data corruption. As the D-Class descends, he notes that there's a lot of strange black-yellow vines growing around the walls of the trench. Several of the large marine spiders can be seen inhabiting a large communal web, and a few minutes later, a large 5007 instance comes into view, clinging to a rocky outcropping. All of its eyes follow the Nautilus, and many of the tendrils on the wall are wrapped around the entity and inside of its orifices. The D-Class remarks on the plane that it's holding onto, and says that he's 528 meters down. Over the next 1200 meters, another 16 5007 entities are seen resting against the walls of the pit, and the D-Class eventually says that all of the natural light is now gone, and he's glad that those things didn't seem interested in him. Suddenly a large shark swims past the Nautilus and attacks one of the marine spiders, surprising the D-Class, who says that he's now 2123 meters down. Over the next 3,000 meters, another 119 5,007 entities and 487 4,159 entities are seen, along with 58 overgrown plane wrecks, most of which are inhabited by the spiders. The D-Class is shocked that he's not at the bottom by now, as he was told that they didn't think it went any deeper than 4,000 meters. He continues down seen numerous unmanned submersibles tangled in the black tendrils, some of which are nearly fully covered by stone. 5800 meters down, he sees a badly damaged human arm, which is visibly twitching, and he says that he can't wait to get back up and go home, as prison is better than this. 6000 meters, he drops down into the brine layer, so visibility lowers. 20 minutes later, he passes into a large mass of human remains, all of which appear to have been crushed, drained of blood, and possessing intact eyes. The D-Class can be heard hyperventilating, as every individual floating in this area is in fact alive, and attempting to move despite the enormous damage to their bodies. All of them can be seen to visibly observe the Nautilus as it passes them. The remains begin to try to grab onto the Nautilus and thump against it, with the D-Class saying that the people outside are trying to talk to him. One set of partial remains floats in front of the Nautilus, looking directly at the camera. Later analysis confirms this to be the remains of the former Australian Prime Minister, Harold Holt, and he's seen mouthing something to the camera although not even Foundation-trained lip-readers can decipher it. The D-Class panics and shouts that they're telling him to go back. He says that he's gone down 6,700 meters, and he's not going further. Contrary to this though, the Nautilus continues to descend, eventually passing back into clear water again. The D-Class desperately hopes that it's all over, and that there might be a different way out at the bottom. He begins to perform calming breathing exercises for 19 minutes, and then says that he'll keep going, currently at 7,208 meters down. 
One of the failed submersibles comes into view at 8,963 meters, visibly imploded, and he says that he's glad that this one is top of the line. 37 minutes later, a large black tentacle can be seen rapidly emerging from below, approximately 8 meters in diameter, with numerous yellow eyes growing on it. The tentacle proceeds to wrap around the Nautilus and begins to rapidly drag it down, as the D-Class panics and begins to pray. At this point, the data corruption begins to affect the footage, but eight more tentacles can be seen rising towards the Nautilus. Three of them possess large openings on their ends, which proceed to open as they approach the submersible, revealing large clusters of eyes mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted to the tentacles. The D-Class can be heard vomiting, followed by a muffled thump as he presumably loses consciousness. Later, the Nautilus appears to be resting on the sea floor, with no rocky walls in sight. Black tendrils cover the seabed, and detritus in the water moves irregularly, indicating something moving off camera. A dark shape begins to approach the Nautilus, but the footage cuts to static again. Later, the Nautilus is resting on a rocky shelf overhanging a drop-off. A mass of thin tentacles are emerging from within this drop-off and are holding two individuals, one of which is a member of the Taberner family. The tentacles proceed to press the individuals together, causing them to fuse together by unknown means with both individuals showing signs of significant distress. The tentacles proceed to further alter both victims, before thin green tentacles enter the frame from above and force themselves into the victim's abdomens, which begin to swell. More static and unclear fragments of images, before the entire frame is filled by an enormous eye ringed with tentacles, large claws, and human remains. The eye is estimated to be at least 650 meters in diameter, and the D-Class can be heard screaming for the entire duration of this portion of footage. More static, some expunged data, and then the Nautilus is seen rapidly ascending, though its cameras are partially obscured by an unknown substance. The D-Class can be heard babbling and vomiting, exclaiming that it saw him. It saw everything. It wants to know everything. And he doesn't want it to see him anymore. Finally, the Nautilus breaches the surface and is recovered, against perhaps all odds. Afterwards, the Nautilus was found to be almost entirely covered in a thick organic coating, visually similar to a black slime mold, but host to dozens of eyes growing from it. The submersible itself had suffered partial crush damage, rendering the access hatches inoperable, so it was taken to the provisional site to be cracked open. Once opened, the D-Class immediately began to attack Foundation personnel and harm himself, showing signs of anomalous physical alterations, namely the growth of numerous eyes over his upper body and arms. He was subsequently terminated by on-site security. Analysis of the onboard computer systems showed that the Nautilus had been taken to a maximum depth of 17,934 meters below sea level. It was determined that the Nautilus would be dismantled and incinerated due to the unknown nature of the material coating it, and construction of a reinforced containment seal to be fitted over the pit was commenced. Construction of the containment seal was completed the following year, at which point it was quickly fitted over the entrance to the pit via drilled anchor points. Monitoring of the reef continued at the provisional site, but a little over 12 hours later, the site ceased transmitting all signals. Shortly after, every device at the nearby Site 40 received an email from the account of a doctor who was lost in action during an early attempt to explore the pit. The subject line reads, I want to see, and the contents include the image of a massive eye, and the text, found you. 
A small percentage of the staff that viewed the email proceeded to undergo anomalous physical changes, similar to those seen in the D-Class, with surgery able to save 85% of the affected individuals. A site-wide network scrub was initiated, and MTF Gamma-6 deep feeders was sent into the provisional site to re-establish contact. Due to adverse weather conditions, the MTF wasn't able to go in until three weeks later, and were given a transcript of the log taken from Captain Wallace's body camera. On approach, the site is seen to be heavily damaged and partially submerged, with multiple 5007 entities resting upon it. Closer inspection shows that both west-facing support pillars have been buckled by a significant impact and three large objects can be seen resting on top of the site. There is evidence of multiple now-extinguished fires, and the protective netting over the site has been removed. The team docks at the site, and massive structural damage can now be seen, with the three large objects appearing to have caused most of the damage. Closer examination of the objects show them to be parts of the containment seal that was fitted over the pit, broken apart via massive physical force. Each segment is coated with a thick organic material, from which multiple large eyes are growing. The material is seen to have spread across much of the exterior surface of the site, and the eyes can be seen tracking the team's movements. The MTF enters the interior of the site, and checks a terminal which shows that the site is running on reserve power only, with the reactor having been shut off by automated systems to avoid a meltdown. Continued searching of the site shows more organic matter growing within the corridor, but no personnel are located. The team moves on to level 6 of the site, where the main command center is located, being forced to use maintenance tunnels due to damage to the stairwells. Ending up directly in the command center, the team locates multiple staff members, all of which have numerous large yellow eyes growing across their bodies and internal organs. In some cases, individuals had their entire torso converted to one massive eye, while other individuals' faces had been replaced by a single large eye. 82% of the site staff were located on level 6 all of which had been altered in the same way. The majority of them remained seated or reclined, though some stood or would move throughout the site. While the eyes growing from these individuals were observed to track the task force, none of the staff responded or interacted with the team in any way. It was discovered that the stairwell and maintenance tunnels leading to level 7 were inaccessible where the main research and containment facilities were located. Remote scanners showed that there was no seawater present in level 7, and the main containment facility was several degrees warmer than the surrounding environment. The team decided to cut through the containment facility and rappel down. Footage shows that the main containment facility is largely undamaged, save for a large breach in the floor, through which an extremely large black tentacle had entered. The tentacle had coiled around the walls of the chamber before allowing its end to hang freely in the air, and its entire surface is covered in spiraling rows of large eyes before terminating in a large fleshy mass resembling elements of human, cetacean, reptilian, and fish anatomy. The remaining staff members could be seen having arranged themselves into a spiral formation around the end of the tentacle, and were proceeding to enter an opening at the tip in single file. These staff members had undergone similar alterations as those found on level 6, to varying degrees. The MTF successfully enters level 7 and surveys the room, at which point Sergeant Hochter attempts to communicate with a less altered staff member, resulting in the team being attacked in mass by all of the affected individuals. The team proceeds to engage the staff with automatic weapons, 
and it's shown that the altered staff fail to die until the destruction of the anomalous eye growths is achieved. The team manages to eliminate all of the staff, with only one member, Private Wheatley, being non-fatally wounded. Wheatley's injuries are treated, as others start to examine the bodies of the deceased, when suddenly the tentacle itself begins to violently attack the team. Four of the team that are closest are either thrown into the walls or crushed, prompting the rest of the team to retreat to the security station and fire upon the tentacle. A distress call is made, prompting the dispatch for a rescue helicopter as the tentacle fails to break into the security station. It then decides to exit the chamber, causing it to rapidly flood. The team is forced to abandon Private Wheatley and leave the site via the breach. Upon exiting, between 16 and 30 tentacles believed to belong to the massive entity can be seen emerging from the sea floor. Captain Wallace can be seen instructing the rest of the team to proceed to the submerged scaffolding to get to the surface, while two of the members are grabbed by the tentacles and rapidly pulled into deep water. The tentacles don't react to the resulting weapon fire in any way. Near the surface, a large tentacle, an estimated 17 meters in diameter, wraps around the entire support column, crushing three more members. Captain Wallace and Private Taylor successfully reach the surface and proceed to wait for rescue, as three large tentacles pick their boat out of the water and throw it several hundred meters out to sea. Captain Wallace complains of physical discomfort and examines herself in the bathroom, finding clusters of yellow eyes on her left shoulder, chest, arms, and cheek. Private Taylor displays similar symptoms, but after being rescued, both are able to be saved through extensive surgery and receive commendations for their efforts. The provisional site is subsequently repaired without incident, and monitoring of the reef has continued, with no further sightings of the massive entity. However, following the repair of the site, security footage was recovered and reconstructed from the on-site servers, shedding new light on the incident. The footage shows stormy weather surrounding the site, with a patrol ship seen circling the reef. A series of extremely loud bangs come from the pit, and the containment seal can be seen buckling outwards, prompting alarms to sound from the site and on-site security to mobilize. All visible 5007 entities begin to approach the site, as fractures can be seen forming along the containment seal. Shortly after, the containment seal ruptures as five large tentacles emerge from the breach in the seal and pry it off. The patrol vessel opens fire upon the tentacles, but three of the 5007 entities lift the boat into the air and drop it onto the reef, where one of the large tentacles drags it into the pit. A number of the entities can be seen attacking the site, working cooperatively to remove the protective netting, but automated security systems and on-site security manage to incapacitate three of them. The tentacles emerging from the pit tear off a section of the containment seal and throw it at the site, resulting in a loss of primary power. Automated weaponry ceases to function, and the on-site emergency lighting and alarms activate. Multiple Foundation watercraft are seen departing from the site towards the reef, but are attacked by the large tentacles before arrival, being crushed before being pulled beneath the surface. The protective netting surrounding the site is soon removed, and the entities begin to attack and abduct personnel in mass. The remaining gunships are thrown towards the reef, with survivors emerging and engaging multiple spiders and 4159 entities. The large entity throws the rest of the seal at the site, destroying the communications tower and causing multiple fires to burn across the site's exterior. A private attempts to hide by climbing into the site's scaffolding, but he's knocked into the water and pulled down by the large tentacles. 
At the sea floor, the massive entity can be seen emerging from the sand, and a number of its tentacles can be seen rapidly surfacing. Meanwhile, surviving gunship crews are quickly overwhelmed by the entities on the reef, and the 5007 entities are dropping captured personnel onto the reef from estimated heights of 20 to 35 meters. The large tentacles are wrapping themselves around the site, causing significant structural damage, and the support pillars buckle under the additional weight. Multiple security personnel can be seen having fortified their position and are aiming their weapons towards an exterior door. The door bursts open as they open fire, and a large tentacle featuring spiraling rows of eyes and terminating in a large mouth can be seen. The tentacle's mouth opens, revealing a large yellow eye, causing all security personnel to display extreme discomfort and pain, with many dropping their weapons. Multiple large eyes can be seen beginning to grow on their bodies, with Sergeant Williamson's mouth notably being filled by one such eye and expanding to cover his entire face. Remaining staff can be seen fortifying the command center, with multiple tentacles converging upon them. The site director is seen attempting to barricade the door to her office, but she's knocked back by a large tentacle. She hides behind the desk as the tentacle splits open, revealing the doctor that was lost in action now severely mutated and integrated into the tentacle. She fires several shots at him to no effect, and he's seen raising his arms and tentacles, causing significant disruption to the camera's feed. The director's skin can be seen beginning to pulsate and bulge, and the doctor emits a loud wail, at which point all of the camera feeds fail. Afterwards, it was decided that the site would be fitted with auto cannons, and no further efforts to seal the pit would be made. Further research into the nature of the massive entity is to be made a priority, with the most non-invasive methods available. So, there's some gigantic tentacled entity lurking under the ocean that uses its minions to abduct people and somehow keeps them alive in perpetual aquatic torment. What exactly it is, or wants, is a complete mystery, but the Foundation has decided that it's for the best if they annoy it as little as possible, seeing as how it even has the capabilities of sending anomalous emails if it wants. The horror aspect of the SCP universe is at its best when it's not only creepy, or disturbing, but also just makes you say WTF. There's a whole lot of very unusual things going on here, completely alien to our understanding, but it's a nice reminder of how little we know about what lurks in the deepest depths of our oceans.